of the talk this evening is God's Way for Romance. Uh, the reason for the title is that we have a choice of uh, following God's way or following man's way. And we live in an age today where man's way is very different uh, to, to God's way. It's not always been uh, the case. There have been previous centuries um, over a hundred years ago. Past centuries have adopted biblical standards, uh, not that those eras were perfect by any means, but there was an expectation of biblical standards, but that's not the case today. And hence, I have the subtitle, Getting Back to Biblical Courtship. And that's what's needed today in the world, uh, and, and sadly, to an extent, also in the church uh, as well. So I just mention the motivation uh, for the book. Uh, one motivation was to promote biblical uh, teaching on purity and also to defend the purity movement uh, as well. Um, th there have been some very good books on this topic. I really would recommend Passion and Purity by Elizabeth Elliot. Uh, also, Why True Love Waits by Josh McDowell. Uh, various other very good books, mostly from the United States. Um, so I wanted to defend biblical teaching and the purity movement. But I also wanted to explain the dangers of the relationship culture. Uh, Hollywood films promote relationships, but those same films don't teach the consequences, the harmful consequences of relationships. I have personally seen uh, damage done by relationships in both the church setting and also universities as well. In my job, I have been senior tutor to well over 700 students. Um, and I have seen firsthand the devastation caused by relationship splits. I've had students come into my office uh, just absolutely devastated. They, they thought they were in a lifelong relationship um, only to be dumped at a minute's notice. And uh, these students have, have said they don't know how they could get through the course and they've needed uh, intense counselling. I think one of the most common reasons for, for giving up a course can be uh, a really bad relationship uh, split. But sadly, I've seen the same kind of devastation in the church through relationship splits as well. So I really wanted to explain the many dangers of the relationship culture. Now, at the beginning, I want to make it very clear, uh, if you've messed up, there is forgiveness. I think today, many people, perhaps most people have messed up in this area. And so it's good to know that there is forgiveness. Uh, King David messed up and he knew forgiveness and, and he was a godly man. And it's important to realize it is never too late to reform. Uh, if, thing, if bad things have happened in the past, that, that's not a reason uh, to, to behave in the right way now. And a, a period of purity is better than no purity uh, at all. So I wanted to give that message right at the very beginning. So here's the contents uh, of my talk. I've managed to get the first four beginning with the letter C. Uh, we'll, we'll look at uh, commands. That's the really important thing, looking at God's commands then explaining the choices and consequences to those choices before considering the challenges for today. And at the end, we'll, we'll go through a list of objections to purity. There are various objections that people make uh, today. So it's good to go through those. So first of all, what are the commands of scripture? What there's two that I want to go through one, is the command for no sexual activity outside of marriage. When Hebrews talks about fornication, that means no sexual activity outside of marriage, including any kind of sexual touching, like uh, kissing, for example. And the verse in Matthew 5, 28 is really key because what it means is if we have sexual desires for someone that we're not married to, that is the sin of lust. And it follows that if we sexually touch someone who's, who we're not married to, 
that is also uh, the sin of lust. Uh, but a boy can't say, well, I had a long kiss with my girlfriend, but I didn't lust during uh, that kiss. That just wouldn't make sense. So given Jesus has said that we, we must not uh, lust, it then follows that we mustn't indulge in sexual touching outside of marriage. Now, people make objections at this point, and even though I'm going to deal with objections later, I'll just mention a few at this point because it's so relevant uh, to these two verses and this key point. So one objection is this. People say, it's okay for me to touch my girlfriend because one day I might marry her and then that's, that's, and so that's okay. But Jesus did not say, it is a sin to lust after a woman unless there is a possibility that you might one day marry her. Uh, that, it, that just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't work. Another objection people make is they say, my girlfriend has given me permission to touch her, so it's okay. But again, Jesus didn't say it's a sin to lust unless a woman gives you permission to lust after her. If that was the case, then we could go to prostitutes who give us permission to lust. So that, that's not a, a valid objection. And then just one more, a third objection people give is they say, ah, but kissing is just a very minor um, activity. You know, it's just, it's just a small thing. But the answer to that is that kissing is not a minor activity. It is a form of sexual touching. And it's also a, a very strong temptation uh, to go further. Just to give you, uh, just to illustrate this point, the England footballer, Adam Johnson, he was found guilty of kissing a 15 year old girl. And following that guilty verdict, he was given six years in prison. That's how serious the court of law takes it if you kiss in the wrong uh, situation. So in the world, people can see that kissing is a very serious uh, activity. Interestingly, the only people I've ever met who have argued that kissing is not a serious activity are Christians, Christians who try to uh, condone relationships outside of marriage. I've never met a, Christ, uh, a non-Christian who has said, oh, kissing isn't really a serious thing. So it's important to accept the teaching of Jesus. It's not easy teaching, of course, but it's important to accept it in principle, Matthew 5:28. We cannot um, have sexual desires outside of marriage because that other person does not belong to us in, in, in marriage. Now, I just want to make the point here that, of course, when you're, if you're courting someone, you're thinking of marriage, of course you can be really attracted to the other person. You can be really excited about the possibility of marriage. Courtship can even be an enjoyable process, but that doesn't give you a license to lust after someone or to touch them in a sexual way. So this is a really key uh, command of scripture. And this is how the church traditionally had always interpreted these verses. It's only in modern times that people are equivocal about uh, this principle. But there's a second uh, verse that I want to uh, now cover, or sorry, verses, and it's to do with the principle of no relationships uh, outside of marriage. And the two verses I want to mention here, one to do with marriage and one to do with, uh, and one to do with divorce. By relationships, I should explain this, by relationships, I mean being officially joined to someone in a romantic relationship. Today you hear of people announcing that they are officially in a relationship, they belong to each other. Uh, and uh, that is against what the Bible uh, teaches. And the reason for having the second command is that there's a difference between giving away your body and giving away your heart. It's possible to be pure in body and yet give away your heart outside of marriage by by pledging that you belong to someone else. 
But from these commands, it's clear that people should not be officially joined outside of uh, marriage. Genesis 2.24 does not say, so should a man leave his parents, then have a series of relationships, and then eventually settle down and marry a wife. There's a clear, direct transition from belonging to your parents to then belonging to your wife. You shouldn't have these official relationships where you belong to someone else. And Malachi 2.16 uh, is also relevant. Uh, it does not say God hates divorce, but doesn't mind it when a man dumps his girlfriend. God hates romantic separation. He hates it when people divorce and he hates it when people split up uh, from a relationship. Uh, so there are two big biblical principles, no sex outside of marriage and no official relationships outside of marriage. And so we can sum up God's way for marriage like this. The Bible has three types of status. There is the, the marriage status, the engaged status, and the single status, all of which are honorable uh, statuses. The relationship status is not in the Bible. And if the relationship status was a godly status, it certainly would have been spoken about in the Bible. And so marriage is the only way for romantic fulfillment. Uh, it's not possible to have fulfillment outside of marriage. And, and what it also means is that courtship is about a decision, it's not about having fun. When you're courting someone of the opposite sex, you're thinking about marriage, it's good to remember that friendship or that courtship is all about a decision. It's not about having uh, fun. It's also worth summarizing why relationships are unbiblical. Relationships are the world's alternative to marriage. Relationships were designed by the world over the last hundred years and the, the whole purpose of relationships is to be an alternative to marriage and people want the pleasures of marriage without the responsibilities of marriage. So why do I say uh, it's an alternative to marriage? Well, relationships are a type of pseudo marriage. When you hear people say we are officially in relationship, what they mean is we are joined together in this type of marriage that we've designed for ourselves. When people say we are an item, that's like saying we're one flesh. You see, this is the language of marriage. When people say we belong to each other, Again, it's a type of pseudo marriage. And relationships involve giving away the heart. When people say we love each other, it's a profound thing to say that. And that, that's involved giving away the heart. And relationships involve giving away the body to some extent. Uh, in some cases, it's more than in other cases, but to some extent involves giving away the body. So relationships are this alternative to marriage and therefore unbiblical. Now I've used these two terms, courtship and relationship, and I just want to explain why I'm using those two terms, because uh, terms can be important. Courtship means, I mean, the very meaning of the word courtship means contemplating the possibility of a future relationship of marriage i.e. courtship is a means to an end. The end is marriage and courtship is the means of deciding if it's okay. But it's really interesting that over the last hundred years, the world has not liked that term. It's got rid of that term and it's brought in this other term, relationships. The whole point of the term relationship is that it means actually having the pleasures of a relationship like marriage, i.e. it's an end in itself. So it's really significant and telling that the world has replaced this, in general, it's replaced this word courtship and replaced it with relationship. Now I appreciate that the meaning of a word is partly what it means to that person, uh, but personally I would recommend not using the term relationship and going back to the term courtship because of the connotations of courtship being a means to an end, not an end in itself. 
because it's so important to remember that courtship is about a decision. It's not about an end in itself, having fun. So it's good now to summarize biblical courtship. By courtship, I mean the period up to en engagement. The really important thing to remember about courtship is that its purpose is to investigate marriage. You're trying to make a decision. And therefore, you should only court if you're old enough and mature enough to, marriage, uh, to, to, to marry. Of course, in the world, we hear of people as young as 12 and 13 having relationships, because in the world's eye, having a relationship is not necessarily anything to do with marriage. It's about, it, it, it's about having fun. But for a Christian, because courtship is about marriage, you should be old enough and mature enough for marriage before you start to court. And here's a really important point. When you're courting, you shouldn't put pressure on the other person. For example, pressure to be long, pressure to give away their body, their heart. One of the things, uh, if you do counselling, one of the things you, you can see that is so harmful about relationships is that it puts intense pressure on people. You see this even on young teenagers, 13, 14, 15, they speak of the pressure of relationships, the pressure to be long, the pressure to be there, the pressure not to dump the other person. There's tremendous pressure. And so when you're courting, you have to be careful not to put pressure on the other person. One of the things Elizabeth Elliot speaks about in her books is that if you are courting someone, it should be easy to back out because if you're courting, you're not in a relationship, you don't belong to the other person. And if you don't feel marriage is right, it should be very easy to back out. And that's one of the key tests of biblical courtship. If you don't think it's easy to back out, then maybe the courtship has not been going in the way that it should have been uh, going. It should be easy to back out. I would strongly recommend in courtship not to make an announcement of an official relationship. Uh, only engagement deserves an announcement, because if you think about it, when you're courting, you haven't achieved anything. Because if you're courting, you're in the process of making a decision. So it's, it's a bit strange to officially announce that you're courting because all you're doing is trying to make a decision. When you've made the decision, and if the decision is to get engaged, then that does deserve an announcement. Of course, we live in a world where people will put on their social media page, uh, they're announcing their relationship status, they're in a relationship, uh, but I would very strongly recommend uh, Christians don't do that because courtship is about a decision. And I would also uh, advise to be cautious about giving the appearance of being a couple. Now, every situation is different, and sometimes it would be quite difficult not to give the appearance of a couple, but especially in the early days, I would uh, recommend to be cautious uh, not to draw a lot of attention to yourself because that can put you under pressure, pressure to stay together because other people will speculate and sometimes gossip. Uh, so it's good to be, it's good to be cautious. So that's how I would summarize biblical uh, courtship. It's now worth just quickly summarizing types of courtship. Now, when I wrote my Look at first, I hadn't appreciated there are quite different models for how you uh, court. It's something we're not so aware of in this country, but in other countries, there are really quite a range of ways that people court. So th this is quite an important uh, slide. What is most common in this country, and this can be fine, is unmentored uh, courtship, where two people independently investigate if marriage uh, is right. So th that's very common in this country, but there are several ways other than that to carry out courtship. So a second one is to have mentored courtship where you involve a pastor, a church elder, and you keep them abreast of how things are developing. And uh, this can be a very good idea because other people can see things you can't uh, and to have uh, 
a very wise, experienced uh, church elder uh, to, to ask advice is a really helpful thing. It's a big decision who you marry. So it's good to, to have mentoring. Some Christians even choose to court via mentors. So they don't have much direct meeting at all, but they actually communicate via mentors. I know at least one couple where this happened, they went on to get married and they were very pleased that they did their courtship uh, this way. They had no direct meeting and things worked out extremely well. But then there's also arranged marriages, uh, sometimes with a trial meeting so you can back out. And there are some arranged marriages with even no trial meeting. Now, the reason I've got the asterisk there is because those, the second to the fifth, obviously need the agreement of all parties. Um, I have met young Christians who really liked the idea of an arranged marriage, sometimes with a trial meeting and sometimes even without a trial meeting. Even in this country, I've met Christians who really want to go that way. Now, for some people, they think, well, that's surely that's mad uh, to do that. That sounds really extreme. But actually, it's not that extreme. When you think how the world behaves, when you think how in the world people will meet in a dark disco or nightclub, having been drunk, that's how people get together in the world. That's, uh, th th this is completely different um, to, to involve uh, very wise senior people, parents and church elders uh, can, can be a very, very good thing. And so, but it's good to be aware that there are different uh, types of biblical courtship, courtship that follows biblical standards. I just want to mention the origin of the relationship culture because this puts everything into context and shows the importance of this subject and, you know, and the, the whole origins of the relationship culture. I, I, I go into much more detail in my book, but a crude summary is this really, before around 1900, society had the expectation of biblical standards. Now, of course, before 1900, there was, there was sexual immorality, there, were, um, there was prostitution, uh, people had mistresses, but the point is this, there was an expectation of biblical standards. That's how people were judged. And actually, you, if you read books by Jane Austen and other period novels, you will see that sex and relationships outside of marriage were considered sinful. Uh, if people had a relationship uh, before engagement, it was considered immoral. And if you, if you, you read books by Jane Austen and people were not joined together until engagement. That was, that was the first time that two people could be considered uh, to be attached uh, to each other. And so things have really changed from those past times. After 1900, gradually society has followed the entertainment industry. As other Christians have pointed out, entertainment is not just entertainment. Uh, we get a lot of our teaching and standards from the entertainment industry. And so following 1900, instead of society following biblical standards, they followed the standards of the entertainment industry. And because the entertainment industry uh, say that sex and relationships are fine, so society has followed uh, that, that way. So that is, the, and it's good for Christians to realize where the relationship culture has come from. Uh, we have a lot of young Christians today who just think, well, that's what everyone does without realizing the, the whole origin of this relationship, uh, what I call the relationship culture. I just have one slide on, on the single status because it's worth emphasizing the single status is an honorable status. Uh, it's better to be single than, than, than to be married uh, badly. And there have been many a very godly single people used greatly by God, people like Amy Carmichael, who worked in India, Mary Slesser, who worked in Nigeria, John Stott, and the, and the list uh, goes on. It's interesting today how the world looks down on the single status. We don't hear of 
bachelors and spinsters today. Everyone is supposed to be in a relationship. But years ago, it was considered very honorable uh, to, be, uh, to be single. So Two choices. Having the Bible makes it very clear that in life we uh, have to make these choices, and so uh, the, it's a biblical principle that we should make that, that we should be cautious in our choices. And so God's way is to choose a spouse with caution. And I would refer to this really key verse from Proverbs twelve twenty six. This is one. A uh, verse that I've uh, often mentioned to my children, uh, probably mentioned it to them hundreds of times. The righteous should choose his friends carefully for the wicked will lead them astray. Uh, so in life, a Christian should choose their people friends carefully. They should choose their entertainment friends carefully. Above all, they should choose their spouse friend carefully of all the choices choosing our spouse is something we should do with caution and one way to be cautious is not to be diving into relationships because the world's way is little caution first date in a nightclub having a one night stand uh getting deep into relationships getting entangled with in relationships that you can't get out of and i have come across christians who've a girl who's got a boyfriend it's turned into a, a sexual relationship and it's extremely hard to get disentangled uh, from that so caution is a really important uh, principle another important principle is the awakening of love god's ways do not awaken love until the proper time that's what it says in the song of solomon and the proper time is marriage that is when you should awaken love but of course the world's way is seek pleasure at the age of 13 why don't you awaken love that's what the world says uh, many children in school at the age of 13 or 14 they'll be asked have you had your first boyfriend yet have you had your first kiss yet have you awakened love yet but the bible teaches wait until marriage to awaken love then we come to the question of sexual intimacy. The biblical question is, how pure can I be? That's a good question to ask. But the world says, how far can I go? I've met many young people who've said to me, how far can I go? And I've said to them, that's the wrong question. The question should be, how pure can I be? And there's the power of temptation. Uh, it's so easy to forget that the devil is real, the devil is clever, and the devil attacks. The devil says, there's no harm in just one girlfriend. And, you know, you just think of this 15-year-old boy or 15-year-old girl, ah, there's no harm in just one girlfriend. But then there's another, and then there's another, and it becomes an addiction. One of the reasons dating sites make so much money is because one of the biggest addictions is dating people have serial relationships and the devil also says a little kissing is no harm but then it goes further and then it goes further and you know the devil is an expert at giving this kind of temptation the bible uh, teaches us that we have to be so careful with temptation it's a really important biblical principle to avoid temptation and one of the ways to avoid temptation is to avoid relationships outside of marriage but now i want to come to consequences the bible speaks much about the consequences of sin uh, the main subject i teach is engineering and physics and one of the most important principles in those subjects is action and reaction to every action there is a reaction and that is true for relationships. And the Bible certainly teaches that. Proverbs has a lot to speak about sexual immorality. Uh, those early chapters of Proverbs are not just talking about 
prostitution. They're talking about sexual immorality. Proverbs 6, 27 says, can a man take fire to his chest and not be burnt? It's asking you to think of action and reaction. In the verse before, Proverbs 6, 26, it says sexual immorality reduces a man to a crust of bread. What a powerful visual picture that is. You only need to think of recent politicians, scientists, where this is true. Uh, it can reduce a man to a crust of bread. And in the New Testament, it warns that sexual immorality is a serious sin. It's a sin against one's own body. Just to mention a couple of other verses from Proverbs 7, 26, uh, for she, the immoral woman, has cast down many wounded and all who were slain by her were strong men. The greatest king, David, uh, he committed sexual immorality. The wisest man, Solomon, committed sexual immorality. The strongest man, Samson, he committed sexual immorality. And if it happened to those great strong men, it can happen to absolutely anyone. anyone. So we need to take the warnings of scripture very seriously. And uh, these warnings should warn us against following the relationship culture. I just want to focus on uh, some of the really serious consequences of relationships. And I just want to consider this particular aspect, how being dumped is devastating. One minute you have dreams of lifelong companionship with someone and the next minute you are dumped. And that is just can be utterly, utterly devastating. And I, again, just to mention that biblical principle, can a man take fire to his chest and not be burnt? If a young girl dumps her boyfriend, does she realize this verse could be very relevant to her? And I just want to talk about the lies of the devil. The world says you can have the fun of relationships without harmful consequences. You watch James Bond, other Hollywood films, you can have the fun of relationships and there won't be any harm. The world says you can dump your boyfriend without harm. You just end your relationships and it should be fine. The world says that with education, relationships can work. And like the, those other two things, that is a big lie of the devil. And the world repeats these lies on a daily basis through pop music, through films, through magazines, through sex and relationships, education in schools. I'll come to that a bit later. These are the lies of the devil. So I'm just going to give you a couple of examples, I think three examples. And the first two come from news in the last couple of days, because you can find these examples every single day in the news. This, this is a young lady who uh, finished her relationship. You know, she had been told by Hollywood films, you know, if you want to end your relationship, you just tell your, your boyfriend that. Well, after she ended her relationship, this is what happened. Uh, her boyfriend attacked her. And this is what it said in the news a couple of days ago. He said, if I can't have you, no one will have you. He then grabbed a bread knife and was chopping me, my face, my arms, hand, my leg. I thought I was going to die. So this is just one example of a violent reaction to being dumped. But you can find these just every day. Uh, the second example. Uh, in this case, there's a young girl, very young girl, 17 years old, Wilma. Anderson, and she ended her relationship with this 23 year old man. Now this girl had been taught by Hollywood that it's fine to have relationships as a 17 year old. She had been taught by Hollywood. And if you want to end your relationship, then you just tell your boyfriends, you know, our relationship is ended. She was decapitated by her boyfriend. Her boyfriend got a knife and cut her head off. This poor young girl who had been taught by Hollywood that it's fine to have relationships. She was totally let down by the world. 
totally let down by Hollywood, totally let down by the relationship culture. But this is what the relationship culture does. Just one more example, just to show it's not always uh, men killing or uh, attacking women. It mostly is, but sometimes it's the other way around. This woman uh, uh, stabbed her boyfriend to death. When her boyfriend said he wanted to end the relationship, she took out a bread knife and put it through his heart. So sometimes it happens the other way. The Bible says it is playing with fire to have relationships outside of marriage. Now you might say, well, what's the answer to all this? Well, the answer is simple. The answer is called marriage. That is why God designed marriage. He designed it because anything else doesn't work. Anything else is dangerous. And when you have the commitment of marriage, then that solves, doesn't solve every problem, but it solves most problems and certainly these kind of problems. Now I want to talk about sexual assault because there are some quite staggering statistics uh, in Western countries, including the United Kingdom, about the incredible level of sexual assault, uh, mostly boys sexually assaulting uh, girls. And one study was actually done by my own university, uh, published in 2009 by uh, the University of Bristol and National Society of Protection of Cruelty to Children. And just look at what it says, a third of teenage girls suffer unwanted sexual acts, i.e. sexual assault. Now, a third is just a staggering proportion. At any one time, there are about three million uh, teenagers or uh, teenage girls in this country, three million from 13 to 19. Of those three million, one million will suffer sexual assault. I mean, that is just staggering, either being raped or groped or so something they didn't want. And, and the conclusion to that is really clear. Relationships do not work. Relationships can never work. It will always result in, uh, in, in that. Some people say, well, if we educate boys enough, then they will stop doing that. Uh, but that is just wishful thinking. Relationships simply do not work. There are various other statistics I could present. I could present lots of data about sexually transmitted infections. Over the years, as the relationship culture has become more embedded, so sexually transmitted diseases have skyrocketed. You can see this enormous uh, increase in infections in, in England. Uh, again, it's the consequences of the relationship culture. And relationships also damage marriage and society, not just for non-Christians, but for Christians as well. So how do relationships da damage marriage? Relationships make people expert in divorcing because uh, today, before people get married, it's quite typical that they will have so a few long-term relationships, several short-term relationships, and several times they've been through this process of splitting up. And so when they get married, if marriage becomes a little bit difficult or there's temptation, they think, well, I'm, you know, I'm used to ending these uh, relationships. And, and so people sadly are expert in, in divorcing. But also relationships tend to be very poor preparation for marital roles. The, the Bible is quite specific about what is a husband role and what is a wife role. But you find when people have relationships and they're copying the standards of Hollywood, uh, they then have got into very bad habits with their roles and they find it hard to get into, into biblical marriage roles. But relationships also damage society. Uh, the growth in abortions matches the growth in relationships because by definition, if people are having sex outside marriage, they get pregnant and then they want to have uh, abortions. So th th this is another bad consequence of the relationship culture and broken families uh, is another consequence. And it's really important to remember that the devil uses relationships to attack marriage. The devil hates God's word. 
The devil hates God's kingdom. The devil hates the institution of marriage. The devil really hates marriage because marriage, it holds society together. It makes a healthy society. It's healthy for the church. And the devil realizes that for, for the devil to be successful, he needs to attack marriage, attack marriage outside of the church and attack marriage in the church. And when you realize that, it can help you to have this healthy response to the relationship culture. And again, I want to make this point, relationships do not uh, work. There's also the, the principle worth mentioning that sin spoils marriage. Sin always spoils true pleasure in, in all kinds of ways. And it's certainly true of marriage. I've met uh, people who've really regretted going down a relationship path and realizing there was the danger this was going to spoil marriage. The way to really enjoy and appreciate marriage is to save yourself for marriage, to wait uh, for true love. But now we come to section four and I want to mention uh, a few challenges and today there are great challenges. And I do sympathize with young people uh, facing many pressures and challenges. One of the pressures, the peer pressures today is to have sexual uh, relationships and, and that's hard. But it's important to remember that as Christians, uh, we are not to go the same way as the world goes. Someone once pointed out that uh, uh, healthy fish are those that swim against the flow of water, uh, the, the current, not those that swim with it. Today we have sadly bad role models. There was Prince William and Kate Middleton who lived in sin before they got married. So sadly, we don't have good role models. Today, sadly, there's pressure to dress in a sexual way and uh, Christians should be very careful uh, about not following the world in, in, in this way. And this pressure to date for fun, not to date uh, for marriage. And I've even seen this in, in the church um, where people have said to some of the young uh, young children, you know, have you had your first relationship yet? Have you, have you had the fun of that? yet but uh, it's wrong to date for fun it's it's a serious business and even pressure to view pornography and, uh, and and the accessibility of that so there are great challenges today we need to pray to god for for strength and for wisdom and we need to pray for young people just want to mention now sex and relationships education in state schools because i think some christian parents do not realize exactly what goes on in this uh, relationship education. By the way, what this should be, uh, if, if it was in biblical standards, would be sex and marriage education. But it's very interesting that the world has sex and relationships education. This is what they teach. They teach that it's fine to have sex from a young age. So the whole premise of this education in fact, not just that it's fine, but it's normal to have sex from a, a young age outside of marriage. There's a recommendation to use contraception and there's a recommendation to understand consent. But this is what they don't teach. There's little about the devastation of relationship splits and the violent reactions that can, that, that can happen. And it's so important that young people know about that, but sadly they don't for very, very often. And they don't teach that it's human nature uh, for, for consent not to work. Consent just really does not work. And I'll say more about that, uh, I think, in the next slide. And there's nothing about biblical standards of abstinence. There are lots of examples of where churches in America and the United Kingdom have wanted to come in to sex and relationships education. And the schools have barred Christians from coming in. Um, you are not allowed to even mention to young people the idea of abstinence. So why does sex and relationships education, why does it not work? Because we saw those terrible statistics of so many boys assaulting their girlfriends and so many violent reactions. Education just does not solve the problems of relationships. And at the heart of the problem is this, 
many teenage boys say their girlfriend belongs to them. Just think about that carefully. The whole point of a relationship is that you belong to each other. It's an official relationship. So how can you say on the one hand, how can you say to this teenage boy, your girlfriend does belong to you. You're an item, she belongs to you. However, you can't just get anything you want at any time. The two things are just not compatible. Many teenage boys say, well, if my girlfriend belongs to me, then it's my right to touch her. And if one day she says, well, I don't want you to touch me today. Well, she belongs to me. So I just can't resist that temptation. This is what I mean when I say relationships don't work. And even with all the education in the world, they will never ever work. Relying on consent is like playing with fire. And in any case, many young people don't have much self-control. Uh, you know, it's like lighting a match at the bottom of a haystack. Uh, things get out of control very, very quickly. And many young people just do not understand the devastation of relationship uh, splits. I've seen, it's most common that in, in my experience, young men dumping a young woman and just not appreciating the effect that's going to ha have on that person. Sadly, there are examples of Christians copying the world, having sexual relationships, dating for fun from a very young age, having relationship splits. And interestingly, sometimes you see collateral damage. There have been cases where entire churches have been split when there's been a relationship split and two families have been in the church and it's caused all kinds of problems. Uh, sometimes a lot of collateral damage I visited churches where a Christian woman has become pregnant. Uh, and interestingly, not that many Christian leaders are addressing this issue. It, it's a difficult issue, of course. It's a delicate issue. But in this country, not many Christian leaders are really addressing the issue. And there are even examples of some Christian leaders against purity. Uh, it's not that many, but there are a few. and. People have said to me, how can this be? How can a Christian leader be against purity? I think one of the reasons is there are Christian leaders who've, who've had children, who've had sexual relationships, and they feel, felt slightly embarrassed about that. And they found it harder to um, uh, preach and, and to defend purity. So what has been the reaction to the purity movement? Thankfully, there has been a lot of much positive reaction, especially from homeschool uh, families. I've given this kind of talk in Spain, in Germany and America. Um, in fact, I've had more invites from those countries than I've had from the United Kingdom, which is slightly uh, worrying. But some evangelical leaders have actually criticized the purity movement and defended relationship outside of marriage. That's been quite sad and quite surprising. And in fact, a small number of anti-purity articles have even been published where the editor says they don't necessarily agree with this uh, article, but nevertheless, those publications have actually published those articles, which is really surprising. And there have even been pro-relationship books published by Christian authors. Um, I've read some of those. By the way, the two references, uh, one to the banner online article the, called The Pitfalls of the Purity Movement. It's a very strange uh, title because uh, purity is a good thing. Um, and the one in the Evangelical Times was from January 2017, Trevor Baker writing against uh, um, a book promoting purity in courtship. Now I want to go through quite briefly a list of objections. I'll repeat the earlier ones, but give a more complete list. I think there are seven in this uh, list. People do have various objections. It's good to know the answer to the objections. So the first one is a repeat of the earlier point. I can sexually touch my girlfriend because we are in a relationship and she's given me permission. 
the answer to that is Jesus did not say do not lust except for the case where you have permission to lust. That just makes no sense. Uh, this refers to the article I just mentioned in the Evangelical Times by Trevor Baker, January 2017. Um, so the objection is this, Matthew 5, 27 to 28, which has the teaching on lust, only applies to married people. And therefore, anyone who's not married, i.e. single people, can have a degree of sexual desires before marriage. Now, that's a very radical um, idea published in Evangelical Times. It's very radical because for 2,000 years, if you look at all of the Bible commentators, they have always said that Matthew 5 is fundamental teaching, applies to everyone, not just to uh, marry people. Um, Jesus did never said, do not lust except for the case where you are single. Um, anyone can lust. A married person, a single person can lust. It's a very radical um, uh, teaching and very wrong. Thirdly, it is too difficult to be pure, so we should allow a degree of sex and relationships. We should not idolize purity. Uh, that's what was said more or less in the pitfalls of the purity movement, that article in, in the banner. But the answer to this is that, well, all of God's commands are difficult. That does not mean we should just give up trying to keep them. Uh, every, every one of the Ten Commandments, every command, is, it's difficult because we are simple, but uh, that, that does not mean, you know, therefore we can just ignore them. And it's very wrong to say we should not idolise purity. That's like saying it's wrong to idolise God's commands. It's, it's not appropriate to say we should not idolise purity. Purity is something we should love. Purity is something that we should seek. No one should ever say we should not idolize uh, purity. So purity is a good is a good thing. Another objection is uh, people say intimate kissing is only a minor activity. Uh, I, I mentioned this before, but it's such an important point just to emphasize in a court of law, kissing a scene is a very serious um, activity. I mentioned that England footballer jailed for six years for kissing a 15 year old girl. And if you read the Song of Solomon, it mentions kissing a few times and it's clearly uh, one of the pleasures of marriage. Another objection is uh, everyone should have the liberty to have sexual activity and decide how far to go. I've, I've heard many times Christians saying, well, if it's not you know, if that's not your way, that's fine, but my way is different and I'm going to decide how far to go. But the answer to this is we should not use liberty as an excuse to sin. Scripture is very clear on that. Yes, Christians have liberty, but not liberty to sin. And we cannot replace God's moral code with our own moral code. Another objection is uh, this. Relationships are okay as long as you remember Marriage is the highest form of relationship. I've heard, I've, I've read this from uh, a Christian book which supports the relationship culture. And one of the ways it attempts to justify relationships is, well, it's okay to have relationships as long as you remember that marriage is the most important relationship. It's the highest form of relationship. But the answer to this is that, uh, well, marriage is no longer special. If there is an alternative to the marriage relationship, it's like, you know, it, it doesn't help to say, well, I'll always remember marriage is the most important thing. And in any case, how do you decide how close your relationship can be to a marriage relationship? Are you telling people that, well, as long as you don't become more than 50% married or 95% married, there's no logical answer uh, to this. You can't define it. And, and, and so the answer to this objection is um, marriage is only special if it is the only uh, type of relationship you can have. Then objection seven, it is possible to have romantic fulfillment outside of marriage. This is another comment I, I read in a, a Christian book on supporting relationships. But the answer to this is clearly that marriage is the only path to romantic 
fulfillment. And actually, not only is that what the Bible teaches, but it's actually what you see in the world. I've mentioned so many times that relationships do not work. And the reason they do not work is that marriage is the only path to romantic fulfillment. And it's dishonoring to marriage to claim otherwise. It's damaging to marriage when society believes there is fulfillment outside of marriage. One of the sad things about Western society is this great attack on marriage. I think I have a couple of slides to conclude. And firstly, I just want to ask this question, what makes a wedding beautiful? Uh, it's lovely to go to a beautiful wedding, but according to the world, if the dress and food is impressive, then the wedding is beautiful. Uh, I, I, I found out that the dress worn um, uh, there in, 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 in that by, by Kate Middleton, that apparently the dress cost a quarter of a million pounds, a very expensive dress. And people said, well, it was a wonderful wedding, but she'd been living in sin. So that didn't make it a wonderful wedding. What makes a wonderful wedding is if the couple have saved themselves for marriage. But that's not how the world sees a wonderful wedding uh, today. The best gift you can give your future spouse is to save yourself for marriage. So just to summarize, marriage is the only way for romantic fulfillment. True love waits for marriage. And sexual relationships are very dangerous. It's a very subtle danger. It's so hard to see the danger, but the dangers come. And the devil uses relationships to attack marriage. And it's worthwhile remembering that to help motivate you uh, to keep that, keep on that path of purity. And it's never too late to follow a path of purity, no matter what mistakes that you've made in the past. Um, it's never too late uh, to change. So this is a really important topic for today. I hope that those biblical principles, lessons and examples helpful uh, to you. I have I've written this book on the topic. Uh, there are other books that I've mentioned um, and other books that I've written mostly on the topic of creation. So I hope that is a help uh, to many. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stuart. Uh